Welcome to worship on this first Sunday of Advent. I am so glad that you are here today. If you are worshiping with us on Facebook, what a joy that is for us to, to have you be part of our congregation today through the miracle of technology. Our call to worship this morning is going to be the, the uh, reading of our Advent lit liturgy and the lighting of our Advent wreath. And so Cheryl Gilmore, I invite you to come and uh, do that. Time to go home. We have endured these past few years and know that there is more to face before us. We don't know if we have the strength to withstand what not be around the next corner. And we wonder who will stand with us, who will have our back, who will occupy our corner, who is with us. That is when we begin to wonder these days. Who will light our way and chart our course? Who is on our side? Who will welcome us home again? Home. The prophet Jeremiah speaks of a branch that will be raised. Jesus spoke of a man that will, that will descend. But both point to a hope, a hope that calls us home, our true home where we're welcomed and loved and included, where there is justice and equality and peace. It's time, this Advent season, time to go home. We light this candle as a sign of our hope, our strong hope that there is a way to go home, to the home in Christ, and it starts with us, and it starts here, and it starts now. It's time to go home. Let's all stand and sing, Come, Thou Long Expected Jesus. Yeah. 
season of Advent as we anticipate uh, the coming of Jesus. Is it crazy? Am I crazy? We're starting Advent. I mean, it just seems like we got through with Easter and Pentecost and we made it through the summer now and all of a sudden we're at Christmas almost. Uh, it got here in a hurry. 
and I am excited about it. It's going to be a great season uh, of Advent, and that was a beautiful, beautiful way to start us off for sure. Um, I, I, I have to say a word of thank you this morning. I don't normally do this, but um, when I got home from our little trip, I told Marie that I wanted some gifts wrapped for the altar uh, for my Advent sermon series called Unwrapping the Gifts of Christmas. And so she graciously wrapped five boxes for me last night, and I, I brought them up here. And when I got here, Karen McCormick had already read my mind and put four packages of gifts on the altar table. It looks lovely. It is perfect for my sermon series. Um, that's a Holy Spirit thing because we had not talked about it. And uh, I, I want you to say thank you to Karen McCormick and her helper, Mike. <laughs> and he built the manger. Okay. Well, thank you to you two because now I have five extra gifts down here that I have to figure out what to do with. But I bet I figure it out. I bet I do. Uh, somebody's, somebody's trying to come get them already. Uh, let's let those pass and then we'll go into prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful to be in this place today on this first Sunday of Advent, to be worshiping together with our brothers and sisters on Facebook. Um, they are here with us in spirit and part of our congregation today, and we are so grateful for, uh, for each one of them. Um, and we know, we know we have... We have made it through this week of Thanksgiving and we have been grateful and now the season of Advent starts and there's this mad rush toward Christmas and it gets busy and hectic and crazy and I pray Lord that you will help us find those moments of slowing down and focusing on you. For this season is nothing without you. It's just a chaotic time of parties and gifts and singing and stress and anxiety. And if we can't look beyond that and find the hope that is in you, the hope that that Cheryl led us off with this morning as she lit that candle of hope. Then this season will again pass by making no difference. But I pray, Lord, that will not happen. I pray that, that your Spirit will guide us through the season and that we will remain focused on you despite all that tries to distract us. Because there is so much. But we live in a world that needs to know the, the real meaning of Christmas. Not only know it, but they need to experience it from those of us who call ourselves disciples of your Son, Jesus. Who proclaim to live in the way He lived and to love the way He loved and to be filled with the gracious spirit that allows us to do more than we could ever do on our own in mercy and in grace at a time when our world is so divided and so stressed we need words and actions that bring comfort and peace hope and joy We need Jesus. We need Jesus in our everyday lives. We need Jesus in our work, in our play, in our worship, in all that we do. And so we wait. We, we wait expectantly for the coming of the Christ child again that points us to the reality of the second coming of Jesus. 
but we don't wait without doing anything. We wait actively, living the life that he has called us to live and sharing the gifts that he has given to us. In all of this, we pray in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, our Savior, and we pray together that prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, I'm going to invite our children to come forth for children's moments. Oh, look, it's Nicholas and Cadence. How are y'all? Good. Are you really good? How good? Good enough to get Christmas presents? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll have to check with Santa's naughty list on that. Let me ask you a question this morning. I've got all of these boxes here. Would you like to open those? You would? What if I said it's not time? Oh. What if I said you might be really disappointed? Hmm. Let me ask you this, though. We've got five different boxes. Which one would you pick first and why? Why that one? Because it looks good. It looks pretty. Which one would you pick first? Why that one? Because it's the biggest. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. You know, some people would pick the smallest because they think the smallest one has the best gifts because small things, uh, dynamite comes in small packages, right? You've heard that? Yeah. But small packages also come in coal. Oh, coal comes in small packages too. <laughs> that sounds like the voice of experience. <laughs> well, we've got a whole lot of gifts to choose from, don't we? And it doesn't really matter which one we start with as long as we get to unwrap them all and see what's in them. Right? Okay. <laughs> but we're not doing that today. Oh. Oh, it's so sad. What would you call... I mean, this is a whole bunch of gifts. If you got one gift, that'd be good, right? If you got two gifts, that would be better. What would, it, what would you call it to get five gifts? Christmas. He's got it. Christmas. Christmas. Well, what if I told you that five gifts is just a little bit of what God gives us? Can you think of some of the gifts God gives us? Love. Grace. Hope. Freedom. Man, they're good. They're rattling them off. Yeah, good job. You did a we're going to be talking about the gifts that God gives us at Christmas over the next five weeks. That's why there's five boxes. Um, and that's not even close to all the gifts God gives us, but we're going to be talking about five different gifts that God gives us at Christmas. And so I hope that you'll learn about God being able to give us a whole bunch of different kinds of gifts all the time. And that's what we're talking about today. A whole bunch of gifts all the time. That's God. That's pretty cool, isn't it? He's a pretty good giver, right? The best giver of all. So we remember that and we think about Jesus when it comes to Christmas. Because it's not about really what's all in these boxes. It's about the gifts that God gives us in Jesus, right? Alright, are y'all ready to get ready for Christmas over the next five weeks? Four weeks? Five weeks? Four weeks? What is it? Four weeks? Yeah, four weeks. Because we're going to open the last one the Sunday after Christmas. Actually, we're not going to open them. We're just going to talk about them. 
Because I make the rules. <laughs> you wouldn't be happy. And I know. But you will be happy with the gifts God gives us, right? All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, thank you for loving us and giving us gifts like love, like hope, and like Jesus. Help us to, to receive those gifts and give thanks for them. Amen. All right, we'll see you all next week, okay? I hope they're not breakable. I'm proud of those two. They did awesome. I mean, they have an advantage, right? They live across the street from a preacher. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh huh. That's it. Actually, I think they're taught well somewhere. Sunday school, shine at home. Uh, they were getting it right. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, here we are. Um, ready to start a new sermon series called "Unwrapping the Gifts of Christmas." Let's go to God in prayer. God, I pray as always that you take the meager offerings that I have and you make them extraordinary. So speak through me or speak in spite of me, but speak and begin to share with us the message about your gifts of Christmas. And we will prepare ourselves to receive them. Amen. Who's through Christmas shopping already? You overachievers. <laughs> overachievers. Who hasn't even started Christmas shopping yet? Yay! Yay for the procrastinators and the underachievers. I started thinking about it. Oh, you started thinking about it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I think we kind of talked about it a little bit and shared some ideas back and forth, but we had not really started shopping yet. Um, man, gift giving is a big part, part of Christmas, isn't it? it, it it's, a, it's taken up a big part of our Christmas. I was wondering, you know, where did it really get started? And you may know some of this. Um, in the Christian tradition, gift giving, it, it got started based on the gifts of the Magi, right? It's related back. That's kind of how we justify it. Because we're going to give gifts to each other because the Magi gave gifts to Jesus. So that makes it okay for us to give gifts to each other. Um, and really, uh, it didn't really start occurring in the church until after this guy named Saint Nicholas in 312 AD, uh, who was a who was a a Christian who was known for his gift giving. He was very generous in his gift giving. But did you know that Christian gift giving really has its roots in something that was not Christian at all? Because it goes further back than Christmas. There was a pagan Roman festival uh, called Saturnalia. Um, and they used it, it went from December the 17th, that's a good day, by the way, through December 23rd, and uh, on December the 19th, they would give each other gifts. And this was happening well before Jesus came in, and what happened was, the, 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 the theory is that Christians, after seeing what the wise men did, and after St. Nicholas, they, uh, they said, you know what, we've got to combat this thing that's going on with Saturnalia in the Roman world, and so we... We're going to have this Christmas celebration, but we're going to keep the gift-giving part and justify it with the wise men and St. Nicholas. And so you had two different festivals going on, and the Christians claimed theirs, and the pagans claimed theirs. And the gift-giving continued. 
But something has happened with our gift giving since the time that it started. As I mentioned, the, the, the Saturnalian gifts, they were very modest. Uh, small gifts, usually homemade gifts because you didn't have Macy's to go to um, or Neiman Marcus or any of those. And the early Christian gifts were also very modest. That's not the case anymore, is it? We have gone from modest to extravagant in our Christmas gift giving. I mean, the top gifts every year, when you begin to get list of the top gifts in the United States, especially in the whole for each year, they're all electronics, and they're all expensive. Big screen TVs, um, video game consoles, things that are hundreds and hundreds of dollars. It started out of small, modest gifts, and it has grown and grown and grown. Um, and I'm not here to talk about or judge where we've gone in our society. Okay, maybe I am a little bit, because I think we have gone overboard. Um, and maybe going back to modest would be helpful for some of us. But what I want to do is say, there's a lot of good gifts that are given every year. What's your fondest one? What's your best memory of a Christmas gift that was given to you? Anybody want to share just briefly? I mean, just a, a, just a short couple of words. What's the best Christmas gift you ever received? A Barbie doll. A Barbie doll house. That's pretty good when you're 39. Right? <laughs> I get it. I understand. What else? A bicycle. A bicycle. A bicycle. Anybody else? I think, uh, Mark. The best gift I almost got was this big toy garage, two-story garage, and it had a ramp that you could slide a car down and an elevator that you could lower a car down into and you could work on them and all this kind of stuff. The only problem is my mom and dad couldn't put it together. So they put it up in the attic and they said, well, we'll give it to them for their birthday. And they forgot about it. 30 years later, they had a fire in the kitchen and they had to take everything out of the attic and they found the charred remains of my garage that I never got. That's a sob story. That went from a couple of words about the best gift you ever got to, a, to a, a novel about a disappointment. I don't know how we got there, Mark. I could uh, be a preacher. Oh, by the way, I think I got that when I was a kid. Did so, you really? Yeah, I think so. I yeah, I had a garage, had an elevator. I got that one. No biggie. Except for me. No biggie. Oh, man. We, we all have fond memories of gifts that we've got. Now, my favorite one, I think I've shared this before, was a remote control, radio control car. But it wasn't when I was a kid, because my dad didn't believe in expensive radio controlled car gifts for Christmas. But the kid up the street, well, he didn't live up the street. His grandparents lived up the street, and he was full of rotten. And he got, he got whatever he wanted every year, and he got a new remote control car every year. And, man, I wanted a remote control car so bad, and I never got one until I was probably around 30, okay? <laughs> and my sister got me a remote control car for Christmas. And, and I'm telling you... I jumped up and down, I ran around the house. I, I was like a kid, I couldn't wait to get it out of the box and go play with it, but everybody else still had to open their gifts and it was just, neat. man, it was great. I love that remote control car. Good gifts, good gifts. Let me, let me ask a philosophical question this morning. I'm gonna get deep, this is how deep I'm gonna get this morning, okay? When does a gift really become a gift? When it's given. Okay, when it's given, when it's given, is it a gift when it's purchased, or when it's homemade, or is it when it's given, when, or wait, before it's given? What about when you get it and you wrap it? Does that make it a gift? Um, or when it's placed under the tree at Christmas, is it a gift then? Or is it when it's given away? When it's given away, when somebody unwraps it and receives it then it becomes a gift, right? When does it become a gift? Well, the, over the next five weeks, we're going to be talking about what it means to unwrap 
some of the, the, the Christmas gifts that are given to us by God. And to unwrap something means literally to take the paper off, to take the wrapping off. That's the simple definition, but it goes further than that. Unwrap means to, to disclose something or to discover something, discover what's inside. It also means to investigate in more depth or detail. I'm going to unwrap the, the details of this mystery that I'm investigating, right? Um, but it also makes to make some, means to make something more open or available. You know, every year around Halloween, we have these big bags of candy that come into the office, and as long as they are in their original wrapping in the bag, they're unavailable. But you let somebody tear one corner and unwrap them, uh-oh, that's right, uh-oh, they become open and available. When we unwrap something, we make it more open and available. That's what we're going to be talking about about the gifts of Christmas. Because we all like to unwrap gifts, right? Is there anybody that doesn't like to unwrap gifts? Is anybody awake? <laughs> Are you still on your turkey coma? Um, and especially as kids, I, I love the eyes lighting up down here when they see the five boxes. Let me tell you, they would be very disappointed with those five boxes. Uh, but I love the eyes lighting up. And, and I guarantee you that, that we all unwrap gifts differently, right? I think the same is true with our gifts from God. We all unwrap them differently. Some people with wide-eyed abandon dive right in, and all you can see are strips of paper <laughs> ripping off and flying through the air. No regard for the pretty ribbons or the bows or anything. They just tear them up, right? How many of those kind we have in here? Rip them open. You're not even going to raise your hands for that. <laughs> or don't have anybody that doesn't, nobody opens their gifts that way. Nyla, what? you don't open your gifts that way? What, what way? Like fast and furious? No. No, okay. All right. <laughs> Jackson, here, Jackson does. Okay, I found somebody who's a kindred spirit. Um, my grandmother, on my, my, my mom on my dad's side, or my grandma on my dad's side, his mom, uh, we called her Ma. Her name was Veda, but she was Ma, dude and Ma. <laughs> she took her own heavenly sweet time to unwrap it. Do you ever know anybody like that? She held her pinkies out like she was drinking tea, and she would untie every ribbon, and she would say, Oh, this paper is so pretty. I don't want to tear it. And she would peel the tape back, and she would unfold the wrapping paper. And the, and the thing about it is, in my house, uh, in my family, we went by order of age as to how you open gifts. We had a big family. And, and so there was only one older than my grandmother, and that was my granddad. And he would sit there the whole time going, would you hurry up? I'm next. <laughs> and she would. But she would still get to the gift. And that was her way of being excited about the gift that was being given to her. So we might approach these gifts differently, but it's about the excitement with which we approach them and, and how we receive them. And I hope, my hope is that over these next five weeks, we can share in that excitement again as we, as we begin to unwrap the, unwrap the gifts of Christmas. Now we know that there is more to unwrapping gifts than just receiving gifts, but we like to do that. We like to receive them, right? But Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 writes this. He says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to my childish ways. Now I'm not asking anybody to put an end to their childish excitement about gift receiving. But there is something better that I've learned in regard to gifts as I've grown older. Because as much as I love to open gifts, the biggest joy I found is watching other people open their gifts, whether they're from me or somebody else. But to watch them open their gifts. And I love to watch my kids open their gifts and to be excited for what they've got. And, and they're just as surprised as me sometimes. <laughs> so just imagine God's delight. Imagine God's delight when we, as his children, 
discover and receive and unwrap his gifts to us. Man. Man. You must be so excited. And then realize that that same delight um, is there for others when we help to unwrap those same gifts by sharing them ourselves. And that delight's there for God as we share them, but it's also there for us. Now this series will not only be about unwrapping the gifts to discover them for ourselves, but also about unwrapping those gifts in a way that they can be shared with others. Because each gift really has two components. Discover and share. Discover and share. Now, the last two sermon series, I've done a memory verse because it kind of helps me stay focused, and I hope it does you as well. My memory verse this time for this series is from James 1, uh, verse 17. It's a challenge. It's a little longer than the last one. And instead of seven weeks, you've only got five. So you better put your thinking caps on. You better do some homework. Because you know by the end of this, we're going to have to say it without it written up here. For now, I'm giving you the benefit because you don't know it. Neither do I. Not off the top of my head. Um, but this is our memory verse. Say it with me. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Too hard already? Somebody's backing out? Oh. Oh. Well, I'll tell you, it's out of the NRSV. So you can go get your NRSV and print it out at home. Start where, put it somewhere where you can read it every day. It'll get there. It'll get there. But every generous act of giving is from above. Now, like I was asking the kids, if you're faced with several gifts, how do you choose which one to do first? Who chooses the biggest? Anybody? Bigger? Who chooses the smallest one? Because they know that dynamite comes in small packages. There's a the smallest. There's a the small. A couple of smallest. Who picks the prettiest one with the prettiest bows? That's Sandy. Back in the back, Marsha, okay. Um... How about the shiniest? The ones with the gold wrapping paper. Anybody go for the shiny gifts? Ah, Danny Kusler says, I like shiny. I like shiny. For shiny on the outside. What about, what about the ones who go, um, and, the, and they, the, they're the ones that intrigue you because you've got no clue who they might be from or, or who they're from, but, but what they might be in. Because, you know, sometimes you know who gives what gifts, and if it's the underwear, if it's the underwear, aunt, you open that one last, right? Or do you open it first to get it out of the way? But there's one that, that you go, I don't know what's in that one, so I'm intrigued. I'm going to open that one first. Or it comes from that special person that you know gives the best gifts every year. Oh, it's the best. I'm, I can't wait to open that one. I'm going to open it first. I had a hard time deciding what, which gifts to share and which one to share first. Um, and we might be tempted to open up the gifts that come with the Advent candle each year. You know, hope and peace and joy and love, the traditional Advent Christmas gifts that we talk about, and I don't want to give anything away. There's probably going to be some overlap, but but I went away from the normal first gift. Um, we might be tempted to jump straight to the end and get to the, the gift that we know is coming, right? Jesus. We might be ready to skip ahead to Jesus because it's all about Jesus. We might just talk Jesus for five weeks. But this is Advent, not Christmas. We're getting ready for Jesus, so there's some other things we need to talk about first. So we're going to start right here. And this is out of 2 Corinthians. It's chapter 9, verses 10 through 15. And this is out of Eugene Peterson's uh, The Message. The most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something you can then give away, which grows into full-formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. Carrying out this social relief work involves far more than helping meet the bare needs of poor Christians. 
It also produces abundant and bountiful thanksgivings to God. This relief offering is a prod to live at your very best, showing your gratitude to God by being openly obedient to the plain meaning of the message of Christ. You show your gratitude through your generous offerings to your needy brothers and sisters, and really toward everyone. Meanwhile, moved by the extravagance of God in your lives, they'll respond by praying for you in passionate intercession for whatever you need. Thank God for this gift, His gift. No language can praise it enough. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. Based on that scripture reading, anybody have a guess as to what our gift for today might be? Generosity. Generosity. Oh, did you? You talked about it in Sunday school or you're guessing? Oh, you talked about it in Sunday school. <laughs> That's okay. You got us on the right foot. Ron, Ron Roberts, he said not to give anything away, but... But, but, okay. Generosity. That's right. Generosity. The kind, it's kind of an overarching gift, right? Because God is generous in all of God's gifts. But generosity which is also called goodness in Scripture a lot. The same word gets translated as generosity or goodness. It's at the top of my list. God's generosity. Peterson used its word like extravagance and abundance in talking about God's generosity. Miriam Webster, Webster defines generosity as being generous. Thanks, that helps, right? <laughs> being generous or being liberal in giving or marked by abundance or ample proportions. We understand what generosity is, right? And although it's not always known as one of the top attributes of God, when people start listing attributes of God, Scripture attests to God's generos generosity over and over and over again. Here's just a few. James 1, verse 5. If any lack wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. Our theme verse, James 1, 17, every generous act of giving is from above. Titus 3, verse 6, God poured His Spirit out on us generously or richly or abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Psalm 104 is all about God's provision for creation, including us as humans. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Trust in God rather than in riches because God provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God's generosity is a gift. I read um, a definition of God's generosity in, in one of the things that I was getting reading to get ready, and I don't remember which one it was. I wrote down the quote, but don't remember which reference I'm using, so I'm just stealing it. And it goes like this. The overflow of God's goodness and love that motivates God to give and give and give. That's generosity. That's God's generosity. An overflow of God's love and goodness. Think about it. Think about all the things that God has overflown in, his, uh, in giving. Uh, overflowing giving, creation, providing for our needs, the gift of Jesus, the, the gift of, uh, of the Holy Spirit, or as our theme verse says, every act of giving good things. We just spent a few days celebrating a holiday we often forget called Thanksgiving. It's it is a forgotten holiday uh, in, in, in our world. Um, we get together, we eat turkey, and we have family things, but a lot of times we just forget about Thanksgiving. And the department stores forget about Halloween and Thanksgiving. They start putting Christmas stuff up in July. But we just celebrated a time of giving thanks to God for the countless gifts and blessings that flow out of His generosity. And if you did that, I bet you couldn't count them all. 
Because what happens to me is I go, okay, I'm going to make my list. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, I'm done. Oh, wait a minute. I remember that one. Oh, wait a minute. There's another one. And then I go off and do something else. Golly, that one should go on my list. I never run out of things to give thanks to God for blessing me with. They're countless. Count That's called generosity. And so can we agree, and I'm going to get just a hand raise or an amen or a nod or nope, not off to sleep. Um, can we agree that generosity is one of God's gifts for Christmas? Okay, all right, good. That makes this a little easier as we go. Now, generosity may drive other gifts because God's generous in everything that God gives, but in and of itself, I think generosity is a gift. So we've ripped off the paper and we know what it is. How does it make you feel to know that God is that generous with you? Wonderful. It's incredible, right? To know that God is generous in everything and is dealing with you. God. Wow. Now remember, there are two components to each gift. We just discover generosity. The second component is to share it, right? So if we have been given this generous gift of God and God's Holy Spirit, then guess what? One of the gifts we should be enabled to give away to others would be generosity. Generosity. As a matter of fact, in Galatians 5.22 where it lists the fruit of the Spirit, you might see it as goodness in some places, but it's the same word. It gets translated as Generosity. It's a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, if God gives us His Spirit generously through Jesus Christ, as Scripture says, then one of the fruits we bear is generosity in return. Paul also instructs Timothy in his first letter to, to tell the followers of Jesus to do good and to be rich in good works and to be generous and ready to share. In his second letter to the church at Corinth, Paul writes that those who sow sparingly reap sparingly. And those who sow generously reap generously. In our verse from today, he goes on to say that God gives to us generously so that we can ourselves give generously and reap the blessings of watching others unwrap our gifts. I love to watch people unwrap gifts. And to unwrap the gift of God's generosity and to see their eyes light up, wow. There are numerous places in Scripture where generosity to others is lifted up and praised as a reflection of God's Spirit in us. From Jesus Christ. Generosity. And when we give generously, we, we are in a sense sharing God's gift to us with others. I think that's the way it's supposed to work. Now there's numerous ways to do this and I know first off you're going to say he's a preacher, he's going to talk about money. You're right. I am. Because money is a spiritual thing or how we treat money is a spiritual thing. We think of our resources when we talk generosity. And, and we, we, we can support and be generous with our resources in a whole lot of ways. Support our church and its ministries through our tithes and through our offerings. Which, by the way, you're going to have an opportunity to commit to 2022 over the next couple of weeks. It's coming. I just want you to be praying about what your commitment to support the mission and ministry of our church is. Um, we can give second mile gifts and, and support the mission and outreach efforts that are outside turning the lights on and, and, and paying the staff and uh, having programs for our kids. But you can give second mile gifts to, to support those outreach efforts of the church. You can offer financial support to social organizations that help our community and our neighbors. And we can offer, offer assistance to individuals who are in need when those needs arise. There are a lot of ways to use our financial resources to be generous 
I want to share just a brief little snippet of a story with you. In 2014, some of you might remember that year, um, Marie and I affectionately refer to it as the year from, as my dad would say, H-E double hockey sticks. There was a lot going on that year. We were doing the renovation of the church. It was busy. It was crazy. And that was all good. But that was the year we, we, we got the diagnosis of cancer. That was the year that we had a broken ankle. That was the year that the engine blew on the truck. That was the, you, you get my point, over and over and over and over and over again. And it was a tough, tough year. Um, and a gentleman um, came up to us and came up to me and said, uh, can I help you through this time? No, wait a minute. I don't think he said, can I help you? He said, I want to help you because I know your medical bills have to be astounding. And I, I wasn't even sure how to respond, but he wrote a check. Let me tell you, it was a significant check. It was a check that was enough that that I'm not sure seven years later that we would be out of medical uh, debt had we not received that check in 2014. That's the epitome of generosity, that this person did not have to share, he'll remain nameless, um, did not have to share, but shared because he had been given generously to by God. And he understood his job was to share with others. He saw the need, and he stepped up and met it. And I can't thank that person enough for that. But we're not just talking money when we talk generosity. Um, believe it or not, preachers see beyond the dollar bill. Um, it includes all of our resources. All of our goods. I mean, every time you put something in the blessing box out here, um, it, it, it includes our energy and our time and our patience, how, how generous have you been with your patience this year? It's not been easy, has it? It's been a tough year. But we are called to be generous with our patience, generous with our understanding, and the list goes on and on and on. And I begin to ask myself, how generous are we with all these things? I mean, we know God has been generous to us. We can, we can list the things God has done for us. But how generous are we with all of these things? And I'm not going to stand up here and tell each one of you exactly what to do or exactly how to do it or where you need to give or how much you need to give. Or, but I'll ask you this. I'll ask you to think about how you have personally responded to the gift of God's generosity in your life. What have you done in return for what God has done for you? Just think about it. I mean, we have unwrapped and discovered and received that gift of generosity for ourselves, and we need to recognize and acknowledge and be grateful for that gift, but, but the real question really should be, how am I making that gift available for others, the gift of generosity? How are we reflecting the light of Christ by sharing the gift of generosity? Discover it, share it. The gift of generosity. And that brings me back to this. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And to that truth, the people respond with another truth from 2 Corinthians 9.15. Join with me. Thanks be to God. For his indescribable gift. I'm going to give you one more chance at that. Because I want you to be, I want you to be really mindful of the indescribable gift. And we just talked about one of them today, God's generosity. And the people responded to that gift with Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's pray. 
God, we love to receive and receive and receive, but sometimes we're not grateful enough. And sometimes we don't understand that you offer generously so that we might be generous with others. And so we ask today that you guide us in understanding that you have given freely to us and that we are called to give freely to others. And this we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are going to stand together and sing on the song called Freely, Freely. I don't know if you know that one or not, but if you don't, join in as soon as you catch it. It's, it's pretty easy to catch into. Freely, Freely.